I want, to, I want to start by asking a question, and I want you to keep this in your mind while I'm speaking. Do you want to live in a world where one single tweet, a false tweet even, could be powerful enough to change the course of a presidential election? So hold that in your minds, have a think about it. I work for a social media news agency, and that wasn't even a thing, say, two years ago. But we've, we've built Storyful to take advantage of the revolution in self-publishing where everyone can be a conduit for news, every phone is a way of getting us to the front lines of a war. And it's meant dealing with huge volumes of video, of images, and trying to find the useful, truthful elements within it. And it's a huge challenge. The, the challenge for us is just is coping with how much there is. This is what 24 hours of YouTube uploads look like. There's 100 hours added to YouTube every single minute. And if you imagine trying to find the good stuff in among all that, it's a massive challenge. Another thing that's interesting about it is the platforms that we now find news on, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, they were never really intended for these purposes. Facebook was credited with being how the Egyptian revolution was organized. Uh, but initially, Facebook was invented to help college boys stalk college girls. <laughs> YouTube was invented to help Silicon Valley yuppies share dinner, dinner party videos, and yet now it's one of the repositories, the biggest repositories of uh, information we have about humankind. So how did this all come about? How did these platforms become trusted sources and uh, ones that we go to for our information? Daniel Kahneman is a cognitive psychologist. He's written a book recently called Thinking Fast and Slow, and he talks about how we process information, how we make decisions. And what he says is that if you're, trying to make a, if you're trying to make an argument, if you're trying to make it plausible, you have to do a couple of things. First, it has to be familiar. So if you imagine the platforms we use, most of us are now familiar with Facebook. We're familiar with Twitter. Your grandmother might be following you on Facebook. They're what we know. Another thing is that it has to be legible. So he talks about when you're printing a message and you want it to be persuasive, it should be in white and blue, which are the graphic design colors for something that's credible and it has to be nice and presentable. And the social media platforms have worked very hard to do this. So you can see the old versions were quite clunky and, and hard on the eyes, whereas now we see a lot of blue and white, and everything is quite legible and clear. And the last element that Daniel Kahneman says is important for your message to, be, to, to gain traction is repetition. And this is where social media comes into its own. So the share factor is huge. They are built for you to share every single platform it behooves you to share with your friends, like it, show people what you're, what you're reading, regardless of whether or not it's been fact-checked or it's true. This is the threat, this is where the threat comes to democracy, in my opinion, that something that's false can potentially gain as much traction as a really truthful, deep, important statement. This is a visualization of the announcement that Osama bin Laden had been killed and how it spread on Twitter, and it shows at once the speed and the explosive nature of how stuff spreads, how, how news spreads on social media, but it also shows how disaggregated it is. The two people at the center, Keith Urban and Brian Stelter, they're not major media news organizations, they're not Barack Obama. Keith Urban works in the State Department, but he's just one individual, and Brian Stelter is a media correspondent with the New York Times. So they, they put this message out there, and between the two of them, they, they pretty much told the world. They set the ball in motion. And that was one tweet, but that was a truthful tweet, and it was good that that was spread, and that was fine. What happens if the message gets out, and it's false, and it gains traction? Journalists and the media, we're meant to inform people so that they take action, and they do things based on the information we give them, which is why we try to seek out the truth. I'm going to talk a little bit now about a couple of things. One is bold for Bieber. I hear some laughs, so maybe you know about this. Justin Bieber is a teen pop idol. Um, there are certain age groups for whom he will mean absolutely nothing, but he is absolutely huge. You just have to take my word for it. In October of last year, a couple of internet pranksters photoshopped a message to make it look like Entertainment Tonight had issued this message. Pop star Justin Bieber was diagnosed with cancer earlier this morning. Fake. This was not true. And the second part of the message, Bieber fans are shaving their heads to show support. This wasn't true either, at that point. <laughs> this image got retweeted, it got shared, it went around the world like wildfire, and all of a sudden you had thousands of people going bald for Bieber. <laughs> right, you had thousands of new skinheads around the world 
Justin Bieber hadn't even woke up. He didn't know that apparently he had cancer. But there was thousands of people sharing, shaving their heads in support. So obviously when they found out and when this got reined in, they all felt quite sheepish, but it was a good cautionary tale. Now among the current group of Bieber fans, the Beliebers as they're called, probably some of those will go on to become Wall Street titans, and you would hope that as they do, they rely on better sources of information to make their decisions when they're handling all our money. In April of this year, the Syrian Electronic Army, they got control, they did a phishing attack on the Associated Press, one of the world's most trusted, most familiar organizations. They, got, they phished into their accounts and they got the password for their Twitter account. And they issued this message, breaking two explosions in the White House and Barack Obama is injured. Now you can see from the reactions below, people in the know understood that this was most likely fake. Storyful, we understood this was fake, we advised our clients um, to act accordingly. But the stock exchange, didn't really get it. This is what happened to the Dow Jones Industrial Average on the back of that one single tweet. Right? This is that spike in the wrong direction. That represents 139 billion dollars worth of value, gone. And the reason for it was people had programmed robo traders and high frequency, high frequency trading operations to just search headlines and to not really delve into the context. They didn't check if it was true. This tweet wasn't, and it cost people a lot of money. That return journey in value is greater than Ireland's GDP. So what do people do when they graduate from Wall Street? Well, obviously, they want to go and run the country. So what happens if a fake tweet was, uh, was to be inserted into the debate surrounding a presidential election, and if it could change the course of a presidential election? Well, it's already happened, and it happened in Ireland. In 2011, we were choosing a new president, and there was two people in the running. There was Michael D. Higgins, who was an elder statesman, um, well-respected politician, a poet, a scholar, a tiny little man, uh, quintessentially Irish, <laughs> but a fantastic guy. And uh, Sean Gallagher, um, is, who was an independent at the time, he was a Dragon's Den judge in Ireland, and he represented Ireland's emergence from the recession. He was sharp collared, roll up the sleeves, let's get everything back to business. And he was way ahead in the polls. It was a, a week to the election and he had it sewn up. And there was a, a televised live debate, which was almost a formality at this stage on Irish TV. There had been allegations that, that Sean Gallagher had taken money from the wrong person to pass on to someone else. He had batted these away, it wasn't really an issue. Until during the debate, during the, the live televised debate that the whole country was watching, this tweet was presented to Sean Gallagher, purportedly from one of the other campaigns, saying they had the man who had given him the check. They were going to show him up as, as, as a liar. And he reacted very badly, and the audience reacted very badly, and there was debate for the next couple of days in the Irish media. And all of a sudden, this happened. So on the back of this one tweet, the polls were reversed. Sean Gallagher went into free fall. His campaign just could not recover. Michael D. Higgins soared off. His credibility was retained, and he became Ireland's president. That tweet was false. No one knows who sent it. It wasn't from the, um, it wasn't from the campaign that it said it was from. The person was never presented at a press conference. One false tweet changed Ireland's presidential election. So, it's a threat to democracy. We've established that. What do we do? Do we clamp down on social media? Do we clamp down on how people now communicate with each other? Do we regulate it? Do we, do we try and stop people from communicating? Do we put in buffers? I, I don't think so. The printing press was invented in 1568, I think. In 1631, when it was still a young, disruptive piece of technology, there was a set of Bibles printed in London. A thousand of them got through the presses before they realized the mistake. Thou shalt commit adultery, it said. <laughs> this became known as the Wicked Bible. <laughs> and eventually, they, someone actually read the work, and they said, whoa, hang on a second, we need to change something, and they stopped printing it. <laughs> they stopped printing that, but they didn't stop printing. And print became a huge, changing, a huge force for change in Europe. It spread literacy across the entire con continent and eventually the world. It spread ideas across the entire continent and eventually the world. And I think that when it comes to social media, yes, it's scary, yes, it's young, it's new, it's disruptive, and we don't know how to use it yet, and we have to put our hands up and say, we don't get it. It's not going to change, it's going to, it's going to stick around, it's going to evolve further, it's going to get quicker, and it's going to get better. So, for the sake of all of us, for the sake of democracy, 
for the sake of our money, for the sake of Justin Bieber's fans. <laughs> it behooves us all to actually immerse yourselves in the online world and learn how to communicate better. Less communication is not the answer. More communication is the answer. Thanks very much.